The top story tonight, bulls power ahead on the Lal Street late surge lift sentiment. The sense that rallies over 350 points, the Nifty nears 8,400, but the rupee weakens marginally against the dollar. Crude prices cool off after a short spurt thanks to fresh fighting in Yemen and Iraq. But Goldman Sachs cuts its price forecast. Brent moves closer to the $66 per barrel mark. The goods and services tax could cost the centre an additional 17,200 crore rupees. But relief for the industry as tax exemptions will translate into excise duty rebates. सब लोग एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर आए राजनीतिक मतभेद रखने की और करने की कई सारी जगह हैं उसको विकास के साथ जनता पार्टी इज टोटली बिहाइंड द गवर्नमेंट ओवर द चेंजेस टू द लैंड एक्विजिशन एक्ट एज पार्टी प्रेसिडेंट अमित शाह आल्सो एज दैट पॉलिटिकल डिफरेंसेस शुड नॉट हैम्पर इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ दैट्स अ नेटवर्क 18 इन एक्सक्लूसिव in the final leg of his three-nation tour, Prime Minister Modi woos South Korean companies in Seoul with his Make in India pitch. Both nations signed seven bilateral agreements, including a revised double taxation avoidance agreement. And corporate India comes face to face with a new kind of fraud. Three companies suffer fraudulent takeover via forged digital signatures of its directors. A special report coming up on the show. Medium to large size deals, so 50 plus million dollar deals are, are significantly increasing. Infosys is on the road to reclaim its lost glory, says CEO Vishal Sikha. The company also plans to build a development center in Shanghai. That's an exclusive. And on the hour today, ray of hope for embattled NGO Greenpeace. Delhi High Court agrees to hear a petition challenging the government's move to freeze its assets, issues a notice to the center. And on the hour today, sales via online retail, that's FMCG sales, could actually increase by a whopping 50-fold by 2020. That's according to a report by Bain and Google. We're getting you the highlights. There are many, many uh, uh, initiatives through which uh, freeing uh, some land uh, in Mumbai, uh, which is uh, uh, till now uh, free for certain uh, uh, purposes. A slum-free Maharashtra by 2020, including the city of Mumbai. That's the promise of the new housing policy in Maharashtra. Is that a pipe dream? Is that a possibility? We're going to be trying to answer that question over the next one hour. Good evening here with India Business Hour. I'm Sirpi Upadhyay. Good evening, Kritika. Hi, Sirpi. Lots of action right here on India Business Hour. It's not just a slum rehabilitation from the draft housing policy. The bulls are back. Lots of policy action and corporate boardrooms are, of course, as busy as ever. Not to forget, whole host of exclusive lined up right here on the show. Absolutely. So let's kick things off with the day's trading action first up. And the bulls are on the charge and they're wasting absolutely no time in regaining all the lost ground. It was a steady start to the week and a late rally lifted sentiment as markets ended almost at their highest point of the day. The Sensex rallied nearly 350 points to surge past the 27,500 mark quite comfortably. The Nifty cracked a century and it also managed to reconquer 8,300. In fact, that index is now just a few points away from 8,400. It was all about blue chips today. The mid caps underperformed marginally, but nonetheless, even that index managed to put on a, about a 100 point rally. Anuj Singhal is now here with the day's trading highlights. Anuj, not a bad way to start the week. Good Monday for the bulls and uh, really, I mean, the, the sense you get is that the short, the, the relief rally that you're seeing is now getting some more teeth and uh, traders are eyeing higher levels. Uh, it was broad based, so that was good thing for the bulls. It was led by the large cap stocks. In fact, the mid caps underperformed today. But the, the fact that the market is rising on low cash volumes is still a sad point, and that's something that can come back to ha haunt the bulls at any point over the next few days. Let's talk about today's trade, though, because it was good, and let's talk about the stocks that led the market higher. The Troika stocks that did well, Reliance was up 2%, HDFC 2.5%, and ITC 2%. So Lion's share coming because of these three stocks. Apart from that, uh, some prominent winners included Gale, that was up about 4%. Altotech Cement was up 3.5%. And oil marketing companies, after raising prices for second time in a fortnight, you saw big gains in stocks like BPCL.
In terms of some other prominent gainers, you had a Dr. Reddy's and Lupin both did well, but Dr. Reddy's was up close to 4% and Z Entertainment was up about 3.5%. On the downside, on the Nifty, the only stock that really stood out was Asian Paints and that's after the earnings which clearly disappointed the market and the stock was down a good 3%, down about close to 6% from the high point of the day. On the other hand, some mid-cap earnings which reacted positively right on top was uh, Gen Irrigation. That stock was up 16%. Delta Corp was up about 10% and Apollo Tires was up close to 9%. And some other mid-cap stocks which moved uh, in trade today included Gammon Infra that also reacted to earnings up 14%. C percent and NCC has got itself into a bit of a problem ever since its earnings. That stock was down 9% in today's trade. So as I said, good going for the bulls. The only worry point is that this rally is still not being backed by cash market volumes. Oh, thanks for that, Anut. So a cheerful Monday definitely for the equity markets. Now the bulls may have made a strong comeback today, but are they here to stay? The opinion on the street seems to be still divided. Here are a few market experts on what lies ahead for the markets. The depth and the duration of this correction has actually taken me by surprise. I did not really anticipate the duration to be so long. But at the same time, there are certain fundamental concerns which have emerged, which are possibly responsible for that. There are other markets in Asia which have started doing better, and quite significantly so. Um, right from April, um, you know, we've seen significant buoyancy in that part of Chinese equities which are accessible to the overseas investors, and I mean the Hong Kong-based H shares, as we call it. Um, we've also seen significant degree of buoyancy in, in Korean equity market. So there's a degree of flows that have got diverted into North Asia, and which is clearly reflected in the FII selling in India in the second half of April and in the first half of May. There was no appetite coming into and into this week or the last few weeks, you know, of any more volatility. I, I don't think anyone wanted to stomach that. So I, I think that's what scared people off. And, uh, you know, as you know, I've been pretty gloomy for most of the year. But for the first time uh, in a long time, I, I, I'm more optimistic. But I would say that I have to kind of temper my optimism with the fact that it will be volatile. We have some events coming up. Uh, in June, we have the Fed. Obviously, we have got to think about our own monsoon. So there are going to be pockets of, uh, of uh, volatility which is going to you know, continue to, uh, to hurt us. So, uh, but overall, I think the underlying market is, is, is showing a lot of value now uh, and that's for, for the first time in a long time. Over the last 18 months, the markets have gone up more than 70%. So a 10% correction after that is, I think, part and parcel for any secular uptrend. Uh, what we're also seeing is the FIs obviously have been scaling back on their on their emerging market allocations. It's not just India, but emerging market. And, with, and even within emerging market, they are gearing more and more towards China and Korea and reducing India, which has done very well. So in a way, there is some kind of profit booking by FIs going on along with asset uh, portfolio reallocation. So that was the equity markets for you. Now on to the currency space. The rally in the equity markets has not been reflected in the Indian currency with the rupee ending the day at 63.71, down 21 paise from its previous lows of 63.52. Now weakness in the rupee today is due to fresh dollar demand from banks and importers and possible selling scene across FIIs today. Crude prices, meanwhile, have cooled off in trade today. Now, earlier in the day, prices shot up after fresh fighting in Yemen and Iraq, but Goldman Sachs slashed its forecast, citing oversupply, offsetting most of its gains. So, as you can see, Brent crude at $66.2 per barrel mark and WTI Normex sitting at the $59.5 per mark, both trading in the red. How are the global markets looking like, Sylvie? Well, you've got all-time highs as far as U.S. markets are concerned, Kritika. So, let's uh, look at actually what's going across in uh, U.S. equity action. The key indices are actually very close to those all-time highs. The S&P 500 has hit that record once again today. We're seeing about a quarter percent increase on that index. The Dow is up about 0.1 percent. The Nasdaq also eking out small gains. And this is despite the fact that some of the data that's come out today that's on the housing market is a little below estimates. Quick check on what's been happening across the Atlantic, across the Atlantic and how Europe has been doing in trade today. Let's get those markets up. It's been a fairly volatile session, but the German market has been the strongest right from the 
word go and it's now up 1.3 percent others also in the green at least for the time being meanwhile back home prime minister narendra modi and the indian delegation is in south korea not really home so in south korea and that of course is as part of the last leg of his three nation tour which began in china and then he went on to mongolia the two nations have inked seven bilateral agreements which also includes a double taxation avoidance treaty apart from various transportation projects and an mou in the field of electric power development and new energy industries the prime minister in his interaction with the indian diaspora settled in seoul has also harped on how india's image has changed for the better and that uh, people should come back home and invest in india he says a bricks without the eye which is India is not possible anymore. Inviting South Korean corporations to invest more in India, he says it's his government's endeavor to act east rather than just look east. We consider Korea a crucial partner in India's economic modernization. I'm here at a time of renewed momentum in the Indian economy. We are pursuing a comprehensive program of economic modernization that covers all sectors of our economy and all aspects of our policies and procedures. We have a special focus on infrastructure and developing a world-class manufacturing sector. Korea can be a leading partner in this enterprise. So that was the Prime Minister's pitch to woo investors in South Korea. Now back home, the Modi government has listed out the goods and services tax on top of its legislative agenda. And even as the push continues, it could cost the centre a little more than it had earlier planned. So for starters, centre will have to shell out an additional 17,200 crore rupees just for FI15. This is because tax exemptions to the industry will translate into excise duty rebates. Sapna Das joins in now with the details. Sapna, it's a relief for the industry, but clearly more fiscal burden would be seen for the centre. Oh yes, absolutely. But uh, huge relief for the industry because this is a broad thinking in the finance ministry as of now that all the area-based exemptions, especially for those industries which are operating in Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh, and yeah, of course some bit of activity in Jammu and Kashmir and also the northeastern states, here the area-based exemptions, exemptions will be paid as a direct cash subsidy to the industries. Uh, now, under the goods and service tax, uh, well, basically the arrangement is this, that uh, you want a seamless market, you don't want a tax chain to be broken. Hence, uh, the understanding is that all exemptions will be subsumed. But this is a commitment that the centre has already done to those industries. Uh, some, of the, some of these exemptions may already have a sunset clause. So as in how, uh, till the sunset clause does not roll out, the centre stands committed. If you look at the FI15 estimates in terms of the revenue foregone because of lower central excise duties or other area-based exemptions uh, or excise duty rebates, uh, you can say it whichever way you want. Well, there the estimate was around 17,200-odd crores uh, as of end of FI15. That's the kind of revenue hit that the government will take. Uh, now, under GST, this will be an additional hit because, remind you, the centre will already be compensating state governments in terms of any kind of loss arising out of GST. So, on top of that, you will have the, the impact of the area-based exemptions coming out. But this is the broad thinking as of now, and we have yet to uh, watch, wait, and, uh, wait and watch and see whether the April 1, uh, 2016 GST rollout really happens. Okay, all right, Sapna, thanks so much for that. So that's the next step as far as the all-important GST rollout goes. Moving on, it's been one of the key areas of focus for the finance minister himself. And CNBC TV 18 learns that the government will bring out a simplified income return form by early next week. The new form, which is expected to be shorter and less cumbersome, is also likely to have a simpler structure for taxpayers to declare their foreign travel and bank account details. Remember that the government had to withdraw the earlier form after it came under severe criticism from various quarters for being too cumbersome and complex. Well, to be on to CNBC Awards exclusive then with only eight days to go for the Modi government to turn a year old on the 26th of May. It's time to analyze the hits and misses of the government in the year gone by. CNBC Awards' Sanjay Pugalia caught up with BJP President Amit Shah to decode the government's performance in the year. Shah said that the government has been successful in creating an environment of hope in the country. He also said that the opposition has been wrong for stalling the passage of the new land acquisition bill. Shah said that the opposition should have kept their political differences aside and supported that bill. Here's a slice of that exclusive conversation. Eight 
साल में बहुत कुछ हुआ है संजय जी देखिए एक साल के पहले पूरे देश भर में चर्चा थी करप्शन की मैं निश्चित रूप से कहना चाहूंगा कि विपक्ष में भी हिम्मत नहीं है कि सरकार पर ए, एक साल में एक भी करप्शन का आरोप लगा पाए मैं मानता हूं ये बहुत बड़ी उपलब्धि है चारों ओर एक निराशा छाई हुई थी कि देश किस दिशा में जा रहा है मालूम नहीं है विकास की दर ऊंधे मुंह गिर रही थी एग्रीकल्चर की विकास की दर हो इंडस्ट्री की विकास की दर हो या रोजगार की सभी जगह पे नेगेटिव 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 आ रहा है आज सभी जगह पे पॉजिटिव 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 है और एक आशा का वातावरण देश भर में निश्चित रूप से बनाने में ये सरकार सफल हुई है लैंड बिल एक इंटरप्रिटेशन ये है कि सरकार फेल हो गई पास नहीं करा पाई दूसरा इंटरप्रिटेशन ये है कि कमिटी में जाने से अब ये मोटा मोटा तय हो गया है कि मॉनसून सेशन में ये बिल पास हो जाएगा आपका क्या असेसमेंट देखिए जहां तक पास फेल का सवाल है आप ये समझिए कि लोकतंत्र में के अंदर दोनों सदनों के में किस पार्टी के पास कितने सदस्य होते हैं वो जनता तय करती है हाउस ऑफ पीपल में हमें बहुमत है लोकसभा में हमें बहुमत है और हमने ये बिल को प्रारित किया है मैं मानता हूं विपक्ष की भी जिम्मेदारी देश के विकास के लिए बनती है अगर ये बिल देश के विकास के लिए हम लेकर आए आए हैं तो उसका सहयोग करना चाहिए था मगर नहीं हुआ मगर मैं इतना सुनिश्चित रूप से कहना चाहता हूं हम राज्यसभा में बहुमत में नहीं है इसलिए सीबीआई का उपयोग कर बहुमत करने में विश्वास नहीं रखते हम पूर्णतया संवैधानिक तरीके से बिल को प्रारित करने में विश्वास रखते हैं और आने वाले दिनों में केंद्र सरकार उसी दिशा में आगे बढ़ेगी और हम सबको समझाकर बिल के साथ जोड़ने का भी एक फिर भी प्रयास करने वाले हैं कि भी सब लोगों की साथ चर्चा कर कर इस बिल को प्रारित कर कर देश के विकास को गति देने के लिए सब लोग एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर आए राजनीतिक मतभेद रखने की और करने की कई सारी जगह है उसको विकास के साथ नहीं जोड़ना चाहिए जी एक प्रोजेक्ट है उनका जब तक कंपनियों को ऑर्डर मिलना शुरू नहीं होगा जिससे कि लगे कि अब काम शुरू हो गया है तो डी बॉटल मेकिंग हुई है बड़े बड़े अटके हुए प्रोजेक्ट की लेकिन अभी ग्राउंड पर काम देखने की एक आलोचना आती है इस पर आपके रुके हुए प्रोजेक्टों का आंकड़ा चौदह प्रतिशत से गिराकर छह प्रतिशत पर हम लेकर आए कोयले की सारी खदाने अब करीब करीब जो रुकी पड़ी थी कोर्ट के आदेश के कारण उसका एक पारदर्शी नीलामी कर कर उसको शुरू कराने में भारतीय जनता पार्टी की सरकार को अच्छी सफलता मिली है स्पेक्ट्रम की भी नीलामी अच्छे तरीके से हुई है और मैं इतना बताना चाहता हूं कि पारदर्शी नीलामी के कारण कोयले की नीलामी में सिर्फ बीस ही खदानों का नीलामी हुआ है और दो लाख करोड़ से ज्यादा रूपया भारत सरकार के खजाने में जाने वाला है और स्पेक्ट्रम जो एक तिहाई है आगे के नीलामी से उसमें भी एक लाख नौ हजार करोड़ रुपए का भारत सरकार के खजाने में इजाफा होने वाला है यही बताता है कि सरकार पारदर्शी तरीके से काम कर रही है और इसी के कारण कोर्ट के मामले नहीं बन रहे हैं ओके दैट्स द टॉप बॉस ऑफ द बीजेपी नाउ मूविंग ऑन फ्रॉम चाइना टू मंगोलिया टू साउथ कोरिया द प्राइम मिनिस्टर हैज बीन बिजी सेलिंग द मेक इन इंडिया ड्रीम वन कंट्री दैट हैज डन इट ऑल बिफोर इज चाइना सीएनबीसी टीवी इन स्टूडियन भान कॉट ऑफ विथ टॉप इंडस्ट्री लीडर्स फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड आस्क देम अबाउट व्हाट लेसन वी नीड टू लर्न फ्रॉम चाइना टू बिकम अ मैन्युफैक्चरिंग हब टेक अ लुक You know, China, I think, has a 20-year head start on manufacturing. It starts with the overall approach of the country towards supporting manufacturing, towards recognizing the importance of manufacturing, and creating an environment that is extremely friendly to manufacturing. Um, you see, every global company is manufacturing in China. Uh, we have obviously to learn on the scale side because mm. the scale here is out of, I mean, just yeah. out of proportion to what we are used to. But I think there are also lessons that China can learn from India. I think the way we set up facilities, the way we look at costs, competitiveness, and you know the risk versus reward, 
because we live in a more real world mm. rather than in a world where i think you have a lot more support from the system pavan goenka let me ask you you know we, we we know the problems facing make in india the infrastructure challenges and so on and so forth but what about make in india and using the india ipr advantage and combining that with make in india because so far whatever you've heard from the government really pertains to let's manufacture in india but what about combining the strengths that we actually have on the human capital side the IPR side and then developing for India developing for the world not just made in India well uh, this is my favorite topic uh, i have uh, said many times that uh, make in india is not about manufacturing in india and if we try and do that we will not be able to compete with the old manufacturing countries like china and many new countries that are emerging which will become manufacturing powerhouse we have to leverage ipr we have to leverage the knowledge base that we have in india and therefore focus on manufacturing without a focus on science and technology without a focus on innovation mm. will take us in a direction where i don't think we can come to mm. uh, and therefore we should not try and emulate a model of a uh, china mm. we have to develop a own model where the manufacturing the human skill that we have uh, the human skill that we need to develop beyond what we have mm. comes together with the engineering uh, r&d technology yeah. uh, ability that we have and then uh, make a wholesome package which is unique and better than what anybody else can offer to us you uh, here today signed mous uh, in china what do you think can be done to actually forge a greater collaboration beyond project financing and infrastructure financing you know, basically you know india and china have a relationship uh, uh, which has some strange dimension mm. you know we in india do recognize that the chinese manufacturers have some distinct advantages over us because of the model they have uh, on the other hand we have the aspirations to grow especially with regard to the manufacturing goods so if we open our borders to them we feel fear that they will completely cut the goods yeah. and uh, our our manufacturing is like a baby in the cradle so if we don't sort of protect our industry is you know is going to be dead right mm. in the cradle mm. so therefore we have this kind of a dilemma you know how to go about it the fact remains that uh, we have an unequal playing field yes when it comes to india and china yeah you know this is china for example you have state control control currency you know uh, and secondly you know there are packages and centers that give whereas in india we have to fend for ourselves mm. i think this is this is at the at the, at the heart of the problem All right moving on to that special report we had pro- reported that we had promised for you Maharashtra will be slum free by 2022 that's the maha plan of the state government as far as its new housing policy goes so will it remain a pipe dream or will it finally see the light of day more importantly just how does the maharashtra government plan to fulfill this dream alexander matthew is here to tell us just that alex this is certainly a tall ask how exactly is the state government planning to go about this you have a copy of the draft housing policy what are the details that have been outlined well that's the dream that is being floated by the maharashtra government and to achieve it it is proposing changes to the slum rehabilitation policy first and foremost it plans to change its approach in its policy the maharashtra government has admitted that the approach so far has failed in that only 10% of mumbai slums have been redeveloped in the last 20 years in the first phase of the slum rehabilitation program under the new housing policy the sra will conduct a comprehensive survey of all the slums in greater mumbai within 6 months of the launch of the policy at the same time it will also prepare a master plan on the lines of a town planning scheme and it will follow a whole city all slums approach so slums will not be redeveloped in pockets rather there will be a broad template followed for all slums to point out a few key uh, takeaways from the policy if slums some dwellers have accepted a rehabilitation proposal the sra will urge them to appoint a developer within a year if they fail to do so the sra will launch a competitive uh, launch competitive bids to find a developer and if this too fails the sra is willing to provide viability gap funding of up to 40% of the project cost apart from this the government is planning to launch a scheme for slum rehabilitation by private land owners in partnership with the mara but the key point in the policy is the maharashtra government's proposal proposal to buy a part of the salt pan land on the outskirts of mumbai for the purpose of slum rehabilitation listen in to what chief minister fadnavis had to say 
there are many many uh, uh, initiatives through which uh, freeing uh, some land uh, in mumbai uh, which is uh, uh, till now uh, freezed for certain uh, uh, purposes it's like the salt pan land which is uh, freezed by the central government we are into uh, uh, negotiations with the central government and if the negotiations uh, uh, which are likely to succeed we we, we may get uh, around 600 hectares of land so that was uh, Mr. Fadnir speaking to Shireen Bhan in an exclusive interview last week. Uh, the policy that has come out is not foolproof. It doesn't have a plan for ineligible slum dwellers. And there are also gaps as far as funding of rehabilitation and getting majority consent from slum dwellers is concerned. But these are early stages and a lot of deliberation still has to be done. Back to you. All right, Alex. So speaking as a Mumbai citizen, let's hope that dream does become a reality. Thank you so much for joining in with that. Moving on, in the last three months, the Bombay High Court has adjudicated on three instances of corporate hijacking. In all three cases, fraudsters used fake digital signatures of authentic company directors to take control of the company's boards and eventually their ownership. CNBC TV 18's Main Kadoshi talks to the victims, the digital signature issuing company and independent experts to find find out what went wrong. DDPL Global Infrastructure and Unicorn Infra Projects are associate companies registered in Kandivli, Mumbai. Both are in the real estate business. They share the same promoter, Tharmesh Shah, and the same three directors, Hemant Patil, C.P. Kandelwal, and Sunil Sarda. On 9th March, DDPL's company secretary discovered on the MCA website that these four directors and signatories had been replaced by three strangers, Alok Mishra, Abhishek Tripathi, and Zamil Sheikh. This company secretary was shocked at that time. They informed me that uh, had we changed the board or something. Immediately I, I I told them that these things is not possible. Without board meeting and all that thing, these things are not possible. There may be some mistake, you check that thing. They had checked thoroughly very well and they came to know that there is some fraud had happened in the company. By law, every company director must have a director identification number or DIN issued by the government. Each DIN is to be accompanied by a digital signature. But digital signatures can be changed. So fraudster Alok Mishra used a fake PAN card and MTNL bill to obtain a digital signature certificate on DDPL director Sunil Sarda's name. Mishra then replaced Sunil Sarda's authentic digital signature on the MCA website with this fake digital signature. Using this fake signature of Sunil Sarda, Alok Mishra then appointed himself as a DDPL director. Mishra then appointed two others to the board, Abhishek Tripathi and Samil Sheikh. Mishra resigned thereafter, but Tripathi and Sheikh made fraudulent filings to show that the four authentic directors of DDPL had been removed. That left only Tripathi and Sheikh on the DDPL board. The two fraudsters then attempted to increase DDPL's share capital from 5 crore rupees to 45 crores. I understand that these people must be having an eye on the property because it is a very lucrative project. Just a few months before DDPL and Unicorn were being hijacked, not far away in Bandra, another company was also a victim of a clandestine and illicit takeover. The Shade family incorporated Maniklal Mansukhpai Private Limited or MMPL in 1923. In 1934, MMPL acquired a 13,233 square meter property in Bandra. Over the years, the property was tenanted and then a redevelopment agreement signed. In January this year, MMPL's two shareholders, who were also its only two directors, were shocked to find that a complete stranger claimed to have acquired MMPL's Bandra property. On further investigation, MMPL's two owners found that they had been replaced by an Ajay Harinath Singh, who now owned 96% of the company. 
A series of filings, all made in December 2014, show an influx of new directors and the company's registered office, which has been in Kalba Devi for decades, was shown as shifted to Kandivli and then to Andheri East. These fraudulent filings, made in December 2014, were facilitated by a fake affidavit and fake digital signature of Rajendra Kumar Shait, a former director of MMPL, who had in fact died in 2010. Generally in verification, as per guideline, what needs to be verified? Only the address of the applicant has to be verified. And the other thing we have to ensure is that the bill is not three months old. So for that what is verified is the bill data. And every day when you see some 2,000 to 10,000 certificates are being issued, the clerical person who is at the verification desk, what he does is he routinely verifies the address and routinely verifies the date of the bill and ensures that it is not more than three months old. The purpose of a certifying authority is to certify that the person who uh, is applying for the digital signature is actually the person he purports to be in the context of uh, the telephone bill that he uses, the address proof that he gives and things like that. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think it is uh, acceptable for a certifying authority to uh, rubber stamp a digital signature because that would completely defeat the purpose. Having dealt with three instances of corporate hijacking in as many months, Justice Gautam Patel of the Bombay High Court observes that there is a storm coming and unless the ministries of corporate affairs and of information technology batten these digital security hatches immediately, there will be a catastrophe. These people are like a terrorist to the corporate world, I will say. I, I may be using this harsh word. Reason is this, because today the things that happen with us, tomorrow these things may with, happen with Reliance or with Tata's. Just how technology can be abused, an eye-opener there from the firm. Well, with that, we come to the end of this uh, edition of India Business Hour. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thanks for watching. Good night.